as the weather slowly starts to change, I thought it only fair that I remind you of something you may already know, um, but I spent 13 years of my life in San Diego, California. I think you know that, but what you may not know is that I spent those 13 years swearing up and down, left and right, that I would never, ever, ever return to Indiana. <laughs> I was enjoying the sun and the surf and the sandy beaches of California, and I'll tell you, every time somebody would ask, so Jeff, when are you moving back to Indiana? Never. And I would always, I would always respond with the, the same response. I hate cold weather. I hate that white stuff that falls from the sky. That's an S word in our house. I despise driving on ice, and you cannot surf a cornfield. No thanks. I'm perfectly content right here in sunny California. Thank you very much. In May of 1999, I got a phone call from Indiana. And it was a phone call I never imagined I would receive. It was a phone call from my mother, and she was weeping profusely, trying desperately to find the words to communicate to me that Officer Travis McIntyre of the Noblesville Police Department had been in a tragic motorcycle accident, and he did not survive. Travis was my very best friend. We grew up together, we got in trouble together, we talked about girls together, we were on sports teams together, I joined the Marines, he followed suit, I became a police officer, so did he, and now Travis was gone. So I immediately caught a flight back to Indiana, and soon I found myself in Travis's house, Surrounded by Travis's family, and sorrow filled the air. Tears flowed freely. Everyone missed Travis terribly. He was, of all things, coming home from the gym when he was struck on his motorcycle. But after being in his home, Surrounded by his family, with the sorrow in the air and the tears flowing freely, something unexpected happened. Someone began to share a humorous story of something Travis had just done the week before. And right there in the midst of our sorrow, through the tears, we all began to chuckle and to laugh. And then, slowly, one by one, we also began to share our stories of our time with Travis. You see, actively remembering Travis somehow eased the pain and paused the suffering. Remembering was comforting. Now, some weeks later, as I was reflecting back on that day, it occurred to me, you know, I bet the exact same thing happened with the disciples when Jesus was gone. I imagine the disciples gathering together after Jesus' death and sorrow filled the room. Tears flowed freely as they grieved the loss of their dear friend. And then it happened. Softly, Peter speaks up with a sly grin on his face and says, You know, I just never knew what to expect from Jesus. Do you guys remember? Do you remember that time I tried to walk on water? <laughs> OMG, oh my Galileans. What was I thinking? And remember, I took my eyes off of Jesus for just a second and I started to sing, Thomas, you remember this, right? And, and, and Thomas says, yeah, I remember. And I remember Jesus didn't get mad at you. 
He didn't yell at you. He just reached out his hand and he saved you. And everyone smiles. And the remembering begins and the stories start to be told. As we prepare to share together in the ultimate act of remembrance, as we set aside all other thoughts and cares and concerns, let us remember Jesus. Let's do as I'm convinced the disciples did. Let's spend some time together remembering the life and times of the one, the only, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. Father, we continue to invite your Holy Spirit. What an honor. What an honor and a privilege it is to dwell in your presence as we do at this very moment. We pray, do not leave us. Allow your Holy Spirit to continue to dwell among us and through us. Open our hearts and our minds and even our mind's eye as we strive to use our imagination to remember all that you've done and continue to do for us. Help us as we strive to remember Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. So first, I, I'm going to invite you to remember Jesus, but more specifically, I want to remind you of, of a couple parts of his life. And let's start by remembering the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. Mark chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 kind of summarizes the why of Jesus becoming man and dwelling among us. It says in verse 16, when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with that can't be right. He's a holy man of God. I must be reading this wrong. This says they saw Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors. Who was he eating with? Sinners and tax collectors. When they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors? And they ask this because, come on now, everybody knows if you're really a good person, if you're really a religious person, you would never, ever, ever eat with those kinds of people. Right? We have those kinds of people in our world today. They're the societal rejects, the dirty, filthy, rotten, no good, very bad people, the sinners. And we don't associate with those kinds of people. That's what they thought. It goes on. They asked the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, and I think there's a miraculous thing happening here too, just a kind of a micro point. I don't think Jesus was exactly standing nearby. If he was, they probably would have talked to him directly. I think, as so often was the case, they were talking behind Jesus' back. And Jesus being, well, Jesus, heard them. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, I love his response, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but who is it? Who needs a doctor? It's the sick, absolutely. He said, I have not come to call the righteous. He came to call the sinners that's right in other words he came for people just like you and me people who just can't seem to get it right and keep it right we just can't seem to get it together and keep it together and this is such a beautiful reminder not only of who Jesus was then but who he is today all those people that the world rejected and looked down on and cast aside all those people, Jesus loved them passionately, and he welcomed them fully. Those that religion rejected, Jesus loved, embraced. In fact, he actively sought them out. Remember when the woman was caught in adultery, and all the religious people cried out for justice. Letter of the law saying, stone her to death. She's guilty. The law says, the law says she deserves death. And Jesus looked at this mob standing before him. And he diffused the situation with one simple thought. 
Oh, you want a stoner? Okay, well, here's how we'll do it. Whichever one of you has never sinned, you go ahead and throw the first stone, and then we'll all follow. Needless to say, one by one, these men dropped their stones. I'm sure their gaze remained downward as they slowly left the scene. And once everyone had left, and it was just Jesus and this woman, Jesus looks lovingly at this woman who had not been looked at lovingly in decades. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. You are forgiven. You are made new. Yes, remember the ministry. We also want to remember the miracles of Jesus. First, remembering that the miracles were never about the miracles, but about glorifying God, His Father who is in heaven. Jesus opened blind eyes, made deaf ears hear. He made the mute speak. And some of us wish he would practice the opposite of that today. We know some people who won't stop speaking, and he wish he would mute them. Mute. Jesus touched lepers. Remember, those that were the ultimate outcast. They couldn't even live in the city. And Jesus would not only grow near to them, he would touch them and he would heal them. Jesus even turned water into wine, which baffles my Baptist friends. He multiplied loaves. He basically multiplied one kid's sack lunch, fed 5,000 men, their wives, and all their children. Jesus walked on water. He even raised the dead. Yes, remember the miracles of Jesus. And remember, I think we may have talked about this once before, but, but you'll hear it a few times because it's so important. When we remember the miracles of Jesus, it's so very important that we allow ourselves to remember that we are miracles of Jesus. You are a miracle of of Jesus' ministry. Your life has been transformed because of the blood of Jesus and His resurrection. You are no longer the same person now that you were before you met Jesus. You are a miracle of Jesus' ministry. And I can tell you without a doubt, without a question, I know I am a miracle of Jesus' ministry. In fact, if you had known me in my B.C. days, my before Christ days, you would not have liked me. If you had known me in my B.C. days, you would have discovered that, that all I really knew how to do was too much. I would lie too much, drink too much, curse too much, fight too much. I was the king of too much. I just couldn't stop too muching. But because someone took the time to reintroduce me to Jesus, I now stand before you a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But, but it's even more exciting than that because I'm not just a new version of the old me. No, no, I'm an entirely new me. I'm completely different now than I was before. And many of you are too. Praise God. I'm convinced if I had known you before you knew him, I wouldn't have liked you either. We want to remember the ministry, the miracles of Jesus. We also want to remember the core of our faith, the foundation, the resurrection of Jesus. It's the resurrection of Jesus that reminds us how much God hates sin, but how much He loves us. God hates sin, but oh, how much He loves us. Please don't miss the power of this. On the cross, when Jesus was being mocked, the created mocking the Creator, at that moment when they had done their very worst, when they had nailed His hands and His feet to a cross, lifted Him up, they had beaten Him, they had hung Him on this horrible instrument specifically designed to torture them until they died. 
It's in that moment Jesus looks up to heaven and he says the most overwhelming thing you could possibly imagine. He's in that position. He looks up to heaven and he says, Father, please forgive them. They have no idea what they're really doing. Wow. Even at the point of extreme torturous physical pain, he was concerned about your sin and your pathway to salvation. You hate sin, but oh, oh, how he loves you. And then three days later, the stones rolled away, the tomb is empty, Jesus is nowhere to be found, and Christians believe that, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. He turned a crucifixion into a resurrection. Peter said it this way. He said, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Who, who, witnesses. And this is so powerful. Witnesses, which means there were eyewitnesses. There were eyes that witnessed Jesus dead one day and alive the next. Eyes that witnessed Jesus crucified one day and resurrected three days later. Yes, remember the resurrection of Jesus. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. There were eyewitnesses. It's an actual historical event upon which our faith is founded. And what continues to amaze me, even to this day, is that there was only one disciple post-resurrection that doubted. And the poor guy got labeled as a result. What was his name? Do you remember? Doubting Thomas. Mr. I refuse to believe it until I see it. I refuse to believe it until I see it. I refuse to... Oh, hi, Jesus. And Jesus says, see it. Put your hands... On my hands. Put your hand in my side. See it and believe it. Stop doubting and believe. And suddenly the only one that doubted became one of the greatest missionaries ever to India. And when they asked him, when they demanded of him, renounce your faith in your Savior Jesus, he boldly declared, I will never ever renounce my Savior. And they drove us through his body why would a man labeled doubting Thomas lay down his life in that way because he was an eye witness he knew to the very core of his existence you killed the author of life but God raised him from the dead, and it's through him that I find my salvation. He is, in fact, my Savior in multiple ways. Remember Jesus, remember his ministry, remember his miracles, remember his resurrection, and lastly, lastly, remember his eternal message. I love the way Paul summarizes it. This is, he summarizes this in Romans chapter 3, verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith, where does it say? In Jesus Christ. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. By having faith in Jesus Christ. By having faith in the Son of God. And this is crazy powerful. Listen to what he says next. And this is true for everyone who believes. No matter who we are. This is where I feel so blessed to be able to smile and tell you that the no matter matters. The no matter matters. It says no matter, no matter who we are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're from, no matter how many people you've hurt, no matter how messed up your life is right now, no matter how, how depressed you may feel right now, no matter how angry or bitter you may be right now, no matter how dark your world may have been or may be in the present, no matter how many sins you may have committed, anyone, anyone, anyone who places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will be made new. We are made right with God. By believing in Jesus Christ our Lord. 
And this is true for everyone, no matter who they are. So let me give you a quick equation. Christianity has an equation, and it's very complex. So if you're a note taker, get that pen ready. Here's the equation, the Christian equation. Christianity equals Christ plus nothing. Okay, it's not complicated. I lied. Christ plus nothing equals Christianity. In other words, it's not Christ plus good works. It's not Christ plus baptism. It's not Christ plus church membership. It's Christ plus nothing. Aren't you glad? One of my favorite songs, In Christ Alone. It's in Christ alone that we have the hope of eternal life. It's in Christ alone that we are made new. In Christ alone that we are forgiven of our sins. In Christ alone that the old is gone and the new has come. It's in Christ alone. Now remember, I'm inviting you to remember Jesus, not inviting you to remember religion. Big difference, right? Religion is all about me and do. It's performance-based. Did I do enough? Did I give enough? What, was I nice enough? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Religion is all about me and do. Well, we're not talking about religion. We're talking about a relationship, hallelujah, a relationship with Jesus Christ himself. And the relationship with Jesus Christ himself is not about me and do. It's about Jesus and done. It's not about what I can do. It's about what Jesus has already done. It's all about him. Religion says, are you good enough? Religion says, if I'm good enough, God will love me. If I obey, God will accept me. Relationship says, no, 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 no. See, relationship says, because God loves me, he accepts me. And because he accepts me, I am naturally moved and motivated by that love of the Almighty that it naturally causes me to want to be obedient. It's a natural, reflexive response to unconditional love. And our response is not in an effort to earn God's love, but having sensed His love, again, it's just our natural response to return His love with our love and our obedience. Somebody, either here this morning or watching, joining with us online, we're so glad you're with us, by the way. Some of you need to hear this again. God doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because it's who He is. Love is not what God does. It's who He is. God is love. And there's nothing you can do to cause God to love you any more. There's nothing you can do to cause God to love you any less. He loves you maximum, full force, God loves you because that's who He is. See, 2,000 years ago, God became flesh, and He dwelt among us. He who was without sin became sin, died on the cross, and on the third day, He was raised victoriously back to life, as we used to say, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And when you believe in Him, again, it doesn't matter. The not matter matters. It doesn't matter who you are, how bad you've been, what you've done, what you haven't done. You are made right with God by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. I'm telling you, some of you should be smiling a little bit more. Some of you should be nudging your neighbor. You should be getting excited about this. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are made right with God. Behold, you are made brand new. Your sins are forgiven. They are buried in the deepest of deep seas. They are separated from you as far as the east is from the west. Behold, you are a new creation with new possibilities. Not because you are good, but because God is very good. 